I'm Arthur S. Falls. And I'm Adam B. Levine. And you're listening to The New Renaissance, a show exploring the intersection of disruptive innovation, open source, and the individual. The idea, what we've covered so far, and I haven't heard your VR stuff, is um, disruptive innovation and, like, and what it can do when like, kind of technologies converge, which is what we essentially, uh, which is kind of the takeaway from the Uber conversation, right? And then we covered um, online communities and their behavior and their like their kind of independent existence in the third episode with uh, Sarah Perry. And then we you've covered, and I don't know exactly what the takeaway is from VR. You know, there's always like that cool takeaway that you have at the end when you're like, wow, this is what I've learned. And the direction that I've been looking in, I've been reading a lot of uh, a lot of what's on Ribbon Farm and a lot of other. Um, bits and pieces and trying to apply it, trying to actually produce kind of a holistic picture of what's what's going on right now, you know, and, uh, and the, you know, the grand trends. And there's a, um, there's a good thing blurb at the start of Ribbon Farm talking about how um, we don't live in the information age, we live in the software age. We're basically, you know, when we had writing was this great huge invention and, you know, it allowed all these advances. And then the printing press was the next. And, this, and software is the one that comes after the printing press. And, um, you know, of these soft technologies that are extremely democratizing and enabling. And, uh, and I think what is really unique, the point they made, and what I think is really unique about, about software is that it's out of the hands of uh, all these, the educational authorities to choose who gets to advance down that road. They don't pick who to provide education to, and it's not, uh, it's not decided economically. There's not economic discrimination either. Anyone can have a go. Anyone can jump online and learn about software. And so you get, it basically enables really young people to participate in things that were typically reserved for those, you know, certainly in their 20s or over 25. And it's, it's the fact that anyone with a computer can participate is what allows people like uh, Vitalik Buterin to achieve mastery at a very young age without necessarily being recognized by someone who could provide the tools for that individual to achieve mastery. And I think that's what sets software apart. And I think that is one of the driving forces along with open, the open source movement, the idea that we can all work together and build on each other's work that, um, that allows for, or that's allowed things like the cryptocurrency movement, which is huge. You know, one person came out with something, put it into the open source space, and that allowed everyone to jump on board and work with it. And it was a tool that allowed economic experimentation and allowed software to influence people outside of computers. It's that kind of amazing, uh, amazing emerging culture and technology that software allows and the, uh, and the open source philosophy toward its development. I think that you're right on the money there. And I think the kind of deeper takeaway for, that I've had so far is that even if we don't think about some of these things as automation, they are literally all automation and automation is almost entirely what we con what we call a human progress because when you're talking about something like the printing press well that's automation too prior to that there was a manual way to do it it was much more time intensive and because of that there were all kinds of additional costs associated with it all types of social taboos because there simply wasn't enough production capacity to go around you know the ability to be printed meant that you had to have you know armies of of uh, people to replicate your uh, your work essentially because it was such a manual process and so when you take that, effectively, the, the, what you mean by democratizing it means you make it so that it's not expensive anymore. And but making something not expensive anymore means you re don't require, you know, an army of humans sitting there devoting their life to doing that thing anymore. And instead, you can have these machines that are replicatable and that you can uh, expand your capacity like that instead of having to literally train up humans as these automatons in their own way. If you think about it, you know, what is, uh, you know, what is a scholar, but really a computer that is housed in a human, <laughs> you know, that has this one type of specialty and they can network and interact with other types of computers that are also, you know, also human computers. Um, so, I mean, you see where I'm going with that? That's really the I thing. I see exactly yeah, all of this where you're going. Stuff. Humans as a, uh, as a compute element is, have you heard of the Rhine Papyrus? It's the oldest known mathematical text. No. So it's, six, it's 1600 BC, but they think it's copied from one that's even older than that. It's Egyptian. And its contents are essentially a bunch of mathematical heuristics for figuring things out. You know, they didn't quite have pi, but they could get pretty close. And you did it this way, and this is how you did it. 
as I see it, those uh, those heuristics are the first form of human compute automation. Is uh, that's kind of the first example, and then the reason that we could build these tools of um, automating a human compute element is because we had symbols we could represent values in symbols using writing of course you know that's uh, that was the essential tool that came before we could uh, produce these heuristic systems and basically by manipulating values as uh, represented by symbols in a heuristic fashion someone could pass down the the automated process of say getting the base of a pyramid right to subsequent generations and people that were outside of their immediate influence so just by producing this thing coming up with this idea and publicizing it in you know text <laughs> with whatever they could that uh, that process could be passed down through through generations to distant human compute elements that were otherwise beyond reach we found in world war ii or you know post world war ii post uh, post touring we managed to actually take these human compute elements and take these heuristics and actually plug them into a, uh, a mechanical device and do it that way. And that was kind of the birth of software and the emergence of a new, uh, a new type of compute element that was not pre-existing. And, uh, and really, I think that that is kind of one of the fundamental things is that software is externalized thought. You know, it's a thought you can have and then you can put it into a machine and the machine can actually manipulate those symbols for you as opposed to you having to do it yourself. In the past, of course, it was other, the machine was other people, but today we actually have these tremendously powerful computers that are designed specifically for uh, specific types of software or external thought. Th does that make sense? Yeah, and you know, when you're talking about writing, what you're talking about effectively is the introduction, at whatever point it was introduced into whatever society you're talking about, of continuity. You know, I mean, that's really what writing represents. It represents the ability to take something that is effectively an idea in the mind of one or many people who will eventually die and to codify it in a way that makes it so that somebody coming after them doesn't have to go through that same contextual thought process that eventually led to that uh, discovery. Once you've got that writing thing done, once you've got that continuity, then, okay, well, the knowledge is there, but it's not self-actualizing. So that's what software is. That's what automation is. It's continuity that has been codified into something that can execute itself or that can do most of the work on behalf or that can actually hold most of the knowledge on behalf of whomever the operator is and then execute that on on their behalf and again like that's the that's the thing about all of this stuff is that it doesn't really matter what level you're looking at this at whether you're talking about you know the the first languages or if you're talking about self-driving cars or virtual reality they effectively build on all of the layers that came before so that the person who is operating it at that endpoint doesn't have to know any of that earlier stuff. And so it is effectively, automation is just continuity building on top of continuity to, to fulfill itself. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really deep insight. Well, whenever I think language, I always think as representing values as symbols. You know, it's the, the signifier-signified relationship. I've never thought of it in a really, in a, in a, con in a continuity context and really it's that continuity that's the remote operation isn't it that's uh, access through time we can access yes. people in space relatively easily but uh accessing people across time is impossible to us because we grow old and die but the ability to manipulate values as symbols gives us that continuity and uh and leads to exactly what you're talking about progress it's that uh that creating an autonomous external thought that can then be passed down to subsequent generations to build on top of and refine. You look at a civilization that was advanced in their day, but now we don't understand their language. And I think that's a perfect example of, of you know, the situation that we find ourselves in over and over and over again as just uh, humans existing throughout various times in society. Continuity only matters when people understand the context that comes before. So if you you could you could have you know an entire library, but ultimately if you don't have the basic building blocks of why the language made sense at the point that everybody was right, you know that these things were written down, then the information isn't actually useful to you. You can't parse it with your mind in in the current form because you lack the the other parts. So that's kind of the other interesting part about all of this is that continuity is something that is pretty much specific to civilization or at least to language and possibly to epoch too. So, you know, we really could have gone through many technological cycles in, you know, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years past, and how would we know? We can't even read, you know, Egyptian hieroglyphics from 6,000 years ago.
Right, yeah, and or, or, or Sumerian. I guess we have um, we have difficulty with a lot of Sumerian uh, translation. Just to um, I uh, there was a remark on the uh, episode with with Sarah that we missed out. Uh, we didn't mention um, the Nam Shub. Uh, yeah, uh, Neil Stevenson. Neil Stevenson. <laughs> I was we wondering if I should bring that up. The thing about Neil Stevenson is people often say, you know, get, at least I have the the attitude. Let's say people, uh, I have the attitude that he kind of takes something that someone else has already come up with and takes it a step further and uh, puts it into a book three times longer. He loads it with so many interesting, uh, interesting ideas and insights. And I think the Namshub is really what, um, in a sense, what we were talking about when we were talking about egregores as well. That's the Namshub is a um, is another way of looking at at that phenomenon. So, so let's actually talk about that. That th this is one of those books that a lot of people have read. Not everybody have gotten the context in it. So it's worth discussing that the book we're talking about is Snow Crash, and it came out, I guess, the early nineties. That when it came out. Yeah, the early 90s. I've read this a bunch of times. Totally worth reading if you're at all interested in sort of different types of, of future worlds. And it's sort of the quintessential post-cyberpunk uh, book that you'll find out there. Um, definitely worth reading. The concept of the Namshub, um, as presented in that book, basically is like a programming language that I would speak. If I, if I, if I, it's, it's like a magical language that allows me to put a virus into your brain just by speaking certain combinations of words that are effectively hardwired into, uh, into our brains in order to generate these certain types of states or certain types of, uh, certain types of effects. And in the context of the book, you're right, they do describe it as religion, but fundamentally that's what, what it seems to be presented as, though, is it's religion in that religion is effectively a programming or a, a, a selected virus that does certain things and makes certain changes to the human mind that then brings it as effectively in tune you know with this other organization uh, that that's kind of not a great way to explain it but that's what it seems to be a human programming language that is uh, acts a lot like uh, a lot like we might think that witchcraft would or spells would it kicks the human brain into a situation where to maintain a stable psychological equilibrium it needs to engage in ritualistic behavior. Well, you know, the organism needs to behave in ritualistic behavior. Um, and that kind of is reminiscent of like the repetitive behavior that you might see a, a computer behave that's, uh, that's hung. I was actually, um, I've, I was listening to uh, an episode of LTB recently and my computer hung at a weird point. It kept repeating mm. the same phrase and I thought it was actually in, it's, it was perfect. It sounded like it was in, um, like you'd uh, you'd made an editing error. I thought you'd like edited the same uh, the same phrase in like twice in a row. And I was like, hang on, and it just kept going and going. This guy kept saying this complete <laughs> thought over and over again, and um, it was pretty eerie actually. But yeah, uh, I th you know maybe that's uh, maybe that's another way of looking at it. Yeah. So, so how does so, this yeah. relate to uh, to the new <laughs> Renaissance? <laughs> well, it relates to the new Renaissance in in the context that. What effectively the, the idea of the Namshub is, is that it's putting information into your brain that wasn't there before and making connections that are different than the ones that were there before. And it might be putting it into, you know, uh, fitting it more closely to a template. Uh, as, as a virus can sometimes rewrite the, the, you know, genetic code of what it is that it inhabits, um, injecting new elements and things like that. So in that way, that, that uh, you know, it's pretty analogous. Um, with the new renaissance, again, it all comes back down to continuity and automation. A Namshub, in the way that it's described, is just effectively a viral way of, uh, of transmitting the, this new information and new ideas. And if you think about it, it's honestly not that different from what we're doing with all of the other stuff that we're doing. When you talk about things, you're putting ideas into people's heads. The words that we use are not words in an abstract sense. They're words in the sense that when we say these things, they create images in people's minds. They help you to think about things in different ways. And once those connections have been made, they don't get unmade just because you've stopped, you know, playing it in the background right that second. As the depth of continuity that the individual has access to grows, we experience greater and greater empowerment. And the open source movement is really, it's, it's extremely progressive in that its focus is on producing a collective continuity. Uh, that everyone can participate in, and a collective group of ideas that everyone can develop, mutually develop. And, uh, and it's that empowerment of continuity and automation that's, uh, that's creating this, uh, this new golden age of innovation. And, uh, and when we say disruption, disruptive innovation, really these disruptive innovations are 
many of them are coming from the open source movement. I mean, it is that uh, it is that deep well of continuity that we find in the open source community that is enabling uh, these massive strides that we're seeing today. Yeah. So what that winds up meaning is that uh, as individuals living in the modern age, where we're surrounded by all of this information and you know decades and decades and generations of continuity from all of these different angles. If you wanted to make a discovery in physics, right, then the time to do it was several hundred years ago. When you do have the ability to do that, it stops being about the basic stuff and it starts being, are you at the extreme end of the spectrum and can actually push forward even though all the easy stuff is done and all that's left is, is hard stuff? Or are you on the other side of things where you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily going to be a good use of your time to come up with the absolute state of the art and push the science forward in any one place? But there are all of these opportunities presented because disparate fields of progress can be connected together. And the, as we've seen, you know, as we try to describe with, uh, with the new renaissance, the sum of the parts winds up being much more useful than any one of the individual components by itself. And that's a part of the new renaissance that we really haven't, haven't gotten to yet. We've kind of teased around the edges, but until we have this, the basic, like these are the, the basic enabling technologies comprehensively, we've done an episode on all of these. And here are the things that they're good at, here are the things that they enable, then we can also get to that point and we can start focusing on connecting dots. And that's something I'm really excited about. It's like, you know, I'd love to have a conversation, um, you know, about virtual reality and self-driving cars. You know, I think that once we get these basic uh, episodes done, then the c combination episodes will arguably be more interesting because they represent the step that comes after the obvious one that we're looking at now. Okay. Well, the idea, one of the really incredible things about um, about these recombinations is that once you do develop something and put it into the open source and offer it to the open source community, everyone has access to that, and it empowers everyone to then recombine these ideas and push it all forward. When we talk about the human compute element, which um, I'm not sure you know that's a uh, generally accepted term, but um, we can use it for our purposes. The human compute element is really good at certain things and now that we have a tool like um particularly creativity particularly you know a human is a really interesting and really powerful type of pattern matching engine uh virtual reality it seems to me allows deep abstraction of ideas by virtue of the fact that we can visualize them more effectively using the full power of our eyes our primary sense organ and our ability to, the human brain's ability to match patterns presented to it on its own terms, as opposed to in the most convenient way that we can come up with at the moment, is something that will lead to a new, uh, potentially a new kind of computing revolution. And you've talked about representing labor as um, economic tokens or, or tokens representative of, um, of economic value and how those can actually have um, we see them have, they have value in computer games, etc. I can, I can see those having value for the labor or the, um, the performance of a human compute element, um, operating using virtual reality to perform a certain pattern matching task. On the subject of uh, open source, I actually agree with you. Um, I thought that open source was going to be a much larger part than it has wound up being so far in the initial interviews that we've done. And in fact, most of the uh, companies we've talked to have not that are actually producing something uh, are not open source really in any way. So it's sort of interesting because that continuity conversation that we've been having, that actually is a perfect example of that, is open source represents what is effectively continuity. And not open source, closed source, proprietary products represent something that is not continuity because even if you know it, you're not allowed to use it. And so if you're not allowed to use it and you have to reinvent it yourself in order to get to the place where you would if you were able to use it, that's effectively, you know, dismissing continuity and saying, okay, well, everybody has to figure it out for themselves the first time. Just in the context of the conversation we've been having here, I think that's a really interesting takeaway is that open source is a huge part of the enabling part of the tech and uh and yet <laughs> and
and yet it's not something that's displayed in any way by Uber. You were speaking with Bruce about uh, about virtual reality and uh, and also Gavin Andreessen, and in neither case was there any open source involved in the innovation that those guys were engaging in. No, um, no open source in either of those projects because again, it's hard to monetize. That's really the thing is that having control of that intellectual property, being the gatekeeper who has already figured this thing out. And then if anybody else wants to do it without having to figure it out themselves, they have to pay you. I mean, that, that's what intellectual property is. Well, I mean, those are islands of continuity that, are, are, that can only be bridged by, a, uh, by overcoming an economic barrier. Yes. But the other thing about it, though, is that they're not islands in a vacuum, right? These are, these are companies that exist and that are doing what they're doing in public. So if you think about it, they do serve a purpose. They show that there's a reason here to have something like this in the public, in the public uh, space. It shows that, you know, again, what Uber shows is that, oh, you could do this with an open source platform. It would be much more advantageous for everybody but the platform involved. You'd be able to have competition, and anybody who wanted to launch such a service in order to provide that competition would be able to use this as kind of like a basis. So what you effectively do is you incentivize, you prove the market exists. And then once the market has been proven to exist, the case for making it in an open source fashion or the case for reinventing it you know, once or twice more in order to iterate and get it right and to put it out there into the public space, that seems like you know, it, they do serve a purpose. But if you think about it, the way that our models work right now, they don't support that. Everything is about monopolizing access as opposed to about as, to, as opposed to being about anything else. It's not about adding to generally available knowledge, and perhaps that's what intellectual property was once for. But you know, like you look at something like um, like Star Trek, Star Wars, for example, or even something much older than that. Uh, in the United States, copyright terms are seventy years past the death of the creator. So you're talking about um, properties that are incredibly popular, that are incredibly, um, you know, that have uh, millions and millions and millions of fans. And yet the only people who are allowed to create more content that contains those characters, that contains that, that continuity, again, we're talking about continuity again, um, that contains that are these very select group of rights holders. But there's no possibility for somebody who's just the best person for the job, right? Who's got the best ideas and the best ability to deliver on that to do it. Because it's not about ability, it's about permission. And so the open source almost doesn't matter. It's the continuity that matters, and it's the unstoppable nature of progress that matters. I'm sorry, we're totally going off into the weeds I don't on think this. so. I think, <laughs> I, think we're right on, uh, I think we're right on task, because this is the only way to really string these together. And this is exactly what does connect open source and these closed platforms, is it shows there's a market, it shows there's a way to do things. And if, and if you have this huge group of people, this huge op open source community, vastly more powerful than Uber or anyone involved in developing uh, or Valve or, or, you know, or Oculus, anyone who's developing in this space, they're dwarfed by the power of the open source community just by virtue of the fact that there is no barrier to participation in that community. So anyone can come in and see, look at a problem like transport on demand and look at uber's solution to it to the problem take what uber has done and everything that they've found in the open source community and uh, and build their own superior alternative the open source community can extract some continuity from closed source projects i think that in theory that's probably true but you look at you look at something um like uh computer operating systems and if what you were saying is accurate, then why aren't we all using Linux for everything? Well, I can, I can answer my own question to, to a limited degree here. I know why at least I don't use Linux. I don't use Linux because there aren't as many games on it. Again, like there's this, there's this kind of network effect, even with something like an operating system, where sure, the operating system is an important part, but it also depends a lot on what software is available, what type of interface you're able to inter interact with. And so again, it seems like open source, you know, a product, is designed for people. But open source is not designed for people. Open source is designed for people who want to operate open source software because to a large degree, it is something of an ideology unto itself. Maybe that's just a transitory state that we're in right now where, again, because it's impossible to monetize or has historically been very hard to monetize open source projects, therefore people who would create open source projects and add to the collective you know, knowledge and continuity 
um, are choosing to not make open source products, which means the people who do make open source products are the ones that are as ideological as possible because they're the ones that aren't willing to take the economic incentives. And so you go down there. I mean, like you can see how it feels like this is a, mo a momentum thing almost more than anything else. And that as each new company that creates products that exist in the open source and that functions that function as enabling technologies that allow people to then skip all of the steps that came before and just start from that point, then you do. I mean, in theory, you really should see progress happen a lot faster in these ecosystems. Another thing that you said a little earlier that made me think was um, in the virtual reality, I don't think so much that virtual reality is an abstraction. I think we are used to abstractions and that virtual reality is much closer to not being an abstraction than most things that we exist that we interact with now. When I use my laptop, I'm looking at a two-dimensional screen. Basically, it's a fancy piece of paper that can, you know, that that's not me engaging as a human. That's me engaging as an automaton that knows how to use an, a word processor. When I say that virtual reality uh, allows greater abstraction, what I what I actually do mean is that it is less abstract. So when we look at a screen, we're looking at something that's been already abstracted into two dimensionals. But if you have a, uh, if you're using virtual reality, you can look at similar, uh, you can look at data that is, would typically be represented to your brain in, a two, in an abstract two-dimensional form. And you can see it in a more concrete uh, three-dimensional form. It puts you basically one step closer to it. You're, you, it's hard to think in the abstract. If you can operate on a problem in the least abstract way possible, you can abstract more deeply into it if that <laughs> data is by its nature abstract and the processes that we use to that we use right now where you're putting something onto a two-dimensional monitor that is a representation of something that is abstract and so depend and so you could look at that and you could say well this is this is the the data because i can't see it in pure data form i can only see it represented so therefore i don't view this as an abstraction i view this as what the data actually looks like because it's the only way I have the ability to see it. Uh, from that perspective, turning it into something that is not abstract is an abstraction from the abstraction that we are used to. By giving us more dimensions, literally a third one, we can, in the, in the case of virtual reality, we can actually gain a, uh, a better sense of the data that we're operating on. Yeah, uh, it, it's not the three dimensions. Uh, that, that's the thing that I wanted to put out there is that the two dimensions versus three dimensions, not the big deal at all. The difference is the presence. I am not sitting here in my office operating data, you know, manipulating data that is within this computer that I am looking at with my eyes. It is I am actually within this simulation. I am actually within this interface. And so because of that, again, as humans, we're much, we're very comfortable in our skin. We're very comfortable manipulating the things around us that we can see around us. This is an environment that, that you know, you get very used to existing as a human. And so it's very comfortable to do that, as opposed to what we do with computers now, which is obviously a learned trait and obviously a kind of hacky one, too, that, you know, we've done because we didn't have a better way. But again, it's that whole users versus operators thing. If you can, you know, if you can control your computer just by talking and that actually works, right, uh, then does anybody need to learn how to type anymore? Does that matter anymore? And so, again, like all these things that we that we know how to do because they're just that's the way that you did it. Well, that's the way that you've done it to this point, not necessarily the way you do it moving forward. I'm Arthur S. Falls, and you've been listening to The New Renaissance, a show exploring the intersection of disruption, open source and the individual. As you can tell, this is a big, big, big project, and we are still just poking around the edges. The New Renaissance is different from other shows we've done in that, in addition to each piece of technology or each perspective standing on its own, they all fit into and comprise a part of a much larger narrative about continuity and humanity. It didn't take long for Arthur and I to figure out that this project, this show, is bigger than either of us, and frankly, we need help to do it justice. Adam and I are content creators, and we like digging into the issues, and thinking out the logic. But there's a lot more to the show than that. And here is where you could slot in. 
we're looking for a producer or two who can keep us on track with the big picture, suss out the right topics and individuals to interview. We're also looking for researchers who can work with Arthur and I along with our producers to dig deep for enabling technologies we haven't yet found and connect the dots, coming up with interesting, relevant lines of questioning and valuable angles and perspectives. And of course, if you've got skills as an audio editor, Arthur and I would love to focus more on content and less on editing. If that sounds like a lot of the work we do now, You'd be right and wrong. The show Adam and I do now is just a shadow of what it can be with your help. All contributors will be credited on each episode and receive a share of the LTB coin rewards for their work. If the ideas we're discussing resonate with you, email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com with the type of role you're interested in, and we'll invite you to our private forum to participate and collaborate. Thanks for listening.